Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing part 47 of our Planet Doom Mod Spotlights where we take a look at a bunch of cool animals modders have been making and just use them to have a look at the wonderful uh, our natural world we live in. So um, we'll probably get a quicker one today as well like last time but next uh, tomorrow I've got something special planned for all you guys, something really really awesome. So yeah, we're going to be starting off with a couple uh, Alasta goodies. So this is our Orinokawa goodie. So the Orinokawa goodie, or um, it's called um, Jamara, is its scientific name. Same genus as all the other goodies, of course. And um, they are obviously another species of agouti, and they're endemic to the Delta Amaco in Venezuela. So they're only really found in Venezuela in that delta. And um, they're found in areas with uh, mangroves and rainforest. They seem to be uh, have a little bit more of a diverse ecology than other agoutis. Uh, potentially isolated because they live in like deltas and stuff. Uh, mangroves it makes it harder for them to cross. Really, really cool animals and similar to other agoutis. They tend to be uh, small and uh, shy. They are important uh, seed dispersers because they eat uh, fruits and they bury ones that they don't eat and they often forget about them so they basically just plant the tree for them. And um, they are social or live in monogamous pairs which is pretty cute. Uh, wouldn't you agree? And I think these guys are pretty cute. So this is the um, Orinoco Agouti and these guys are cons least concerned so that means there's no pressing issues other than like uh, your normal ones, habitat encroachment, things like that. So next we're going to be moving on to the last species of agouti uh, in here, wonderful little fellow. This is the Mexican agouti. So um, this is Mexicana, but it's also known as the Mexican black agouti. And it's a species of agouti, of course. And they're found in lowland evergreen forests and second growth forests in southern Mexico. So a lot of that uh, more into Central America um, part of it, the southern um, parts of uh, Mexico. But have also been introduced to Cuba, so they're an invasive species in those areas. But they are, as well, critically endangered and at risk of habitat loss uh, because of um, people obviously chopping down their habitat, since they're only found in a very, very small area in um, southern Mexico. And uh, they are very, very blackish in appearance, where they get the name the Mexican Black Agouti, uh, as you can see here. And um, they're separated from any other agouti found in Mexico, or the only other agouti found in Mexico, the uh, Central American Agouti. So it kind of gives it a little bit more of a distinction, and really, really wonderful, cute little animal. So these uh, two little agoutis were both done by Leaf. He's the uh, porter of these guys. So our next animal... Uh, really, really awesome animal. Oh, I must have done that the wrong way. But next we have got the Black Paku or the um, Talbaki, if you pronounced it. Um, really, really cool animal. We'll have a look at Lou here. I think we did it the wrong way, but that's okay. Um, I really love how this one came out. He did a wonderful job on this one. We'll find one that's swimming a bit more on the water. There's got to be some swimming in the water. There we are. So this is the... Simbachi or the uh, black uh, paku or the giant paku or just sometimes just called the paku uh, they are a, a only member of Colossium that's the genus but they are related to uh, they're in the same family as other piranhas they're a type of piranha these guys are native to the um, Amazon and Orinoco basins in tropical South America and live in all sorts of different river systems from nutrient rich ones to uh, black waters and everywhere in between they just tend to like to live in uh, further inland. And they're widely kept in uh, aquaculture uh, around in their general habitat, uh, well around the world actually. So they're quite common aquarium fish. And they are the heaviest um, chakan in the Americas and the second uh, heaviest scaled fish in South America after the Arapaima. So they're a very, very large fish. Let's see if we can spot one. Really, really wonderful little guy here, don't you agree? <laughs> so, um, yeah, they can reach about 1.1 meters or 3.6 feet long uh, in length and um, about 44 kilograms or 97 pounds in weight. But they more typically reach about 0.7 meters or 2.3 feet. 
and the largest caught one by Robin Reel was about 32.4 kilograms or 71 pounds. So that seems to be the largest one that's been caught on a reel, but there have been large individual sound, uh, found, so they're obviously the extreme ones. And they're quite similar in shape to the piranha, and are sometimes confused for piranha, but they're actually very, very different. They're much taller, much bigger, and they have like these really interesting teeth that are developed more like molars, if you can see that in there. They use to crush uh, plants and uh, nuts and things, since that's what they're adapted to. They're primarily, primarily herbivorous, so it's very interesting. And um, they get the name the Black Paku because uh, their underside and most of their bodies pretty black. And they have small uh, black uh, pectoral anal fins like that. They just generally have a uh, darker color to them. So that's where they get the name Black Paku. Well, look like one over here, so I'm off. Oh, that's not where we wanted to be. It's one of those days, isn't it? He's going off for a swim or watch him. So um, these guys are mostly solitary, but they migrate in large schools. And during the non-breeding season, the adults will stay in like flooded forests of um, like white, clear, or black water rivers. And they will stay there about four to seven months during the flood season. But as the water levels drop, they move into the main channels or floodplain lakes. And at the start of the next flood season, the large schools will move up to white water rivers to spawn between November and February. And the exact spawning location for uh, in the white uh, water rivers are not um, entirely certain. But apparently around like woody shores or grassy levees, that's kind of what we assume. And um, they reach a six, uh, the juveniles will uh, stay near macrophytes and floodplains and stuff all year round, only switching into the adult migratory pattern when they reach sexual maturity, which can be at about 60 centimeters or two feet long. So they kind of hang around where they're born until they're big enough to uh, breed and join the migrations. And they can actually live for a very long time. They regularly reach an age of 40 years, but potentially up to 65 years. So they do a pretty good job for themselves. And um, another little adaption they have is that they are able to grab oxygen from the air because they are able to, um, similar to Arapaima, they can use uh, their swim bladder as almost like a pseudo lung. And... Um, they can also survive with uh, low salinities and things like that. A really, really interesting uh, example of how fish evolved to live in their habitats. And as I mentioned, they uh, eat lots of seeds. They're about 78 to 98% of their diet consists of fruits, but they also will eat uh, wild rice and zooplankton. Uh, also a bunch of uh, smaller things like uh, insects, snails, small fish, uh, algae and decaying plants. That's really pretty much a little bit of everything. And they're actually very, very important as feed, uh, speed, uh, seed dispersers. So they'll basically eat seed and then they'll poop it out and then they will spread it across the river, especially when they're migrating. So it's really, really interesting to see how they will affect. Um, they're very similar in, in the way to agoutis and seeing how they uh, impact waterways and uh, forests and things like that. It's very, very interesting. And um, they often. Uh, are prized in their local areas because they are popular and fetch top price because of, they eat them and they're marketed fresh and frozen and wild populations have declined because of overfishing and many of the current caught fish are juvenile sadly so uh and but they also are uh, now widely kept in aviculture so they can live in oxygen poor water and are very resistant to disease and they're one of the main fish that contributes to um, the uh, brazil's economy and it shows that the uh, Farmed uh, black paku are actually have a similar genetic diversity to wild populations. That's very good, and sometimes they are hybridized with other species that accept wider tolerances, so they can be better kept. And um, juveniles, which are five to seven point five centimeters or seven three inches long, are sometimes labeled as vegetarian piranha and are frequently kept in the aquarium trade. But obviously, being a vegetarian um, piranha. And being much larger, as we mentioned, up to like a meter long, they outgrow their tanks very, very quickly. So yeah, you got to be very careful of that. Uh, and so now we're going to move it on. That was done by Buff Zoo, Leaf, and Jen Bubblywumps. She did, they all did a wobbly, uh, they all did a lovely job job with that. So um, yeah, now we're moving on to uh, someone who hasn't been modding in a while, but decided to come back for a little bit. Uh, or their one of the older mods was released. We've got. Uh, Ron May Ron, or everyone knows Rihanna, a wonderful bird lady, very very wonderful. <laughs> so um, we've got the Madagascan ibis, 
very, very interesting bird here. So, also known as the Madagascar Crested Ibis, or the Crested Wood Ibis, is a medium-sized bird, so they get about 50 centimeters long, and they have a brown plumage to them. They also have this red, uh, red orbital skin and a yellow bill, and uh, white wings and head is bare. So it's very, very interesting. And they're the only member of its genus, um, Lobotus, I believe you pronounce it, or Lophotibius. Lophotibius, I believe they just pronounced that. So as I mentioned, they get about 50 centimeters uh, or 20 inches long, and it's among one of the largest birds in the Madagascar forest, actually. And their head, you can see, is uh, uh, rufous brown, and also the chin and neck under part are dark brown and can be white. Uh, they got the white um, wings and all that, and generally like uh, grayish or reddish body. Very, very interesting. And um, also can be like darker chestnut. And um, they are endemic to the woodlands and forests of Madagascar and live at about altitudes of up to 2,000 meters or 6,600 feet and is found both in primary and secondary forests that includes the humid forests on the northeast of the island and the dry forests in the west and south of Madagascar. So it's very, very interesting. Um, they also have a very, very, very diet. A very, very diet, you could say. And um, we'll have a look at this cute baby, how adorable. Um, their diet mainly consists of things like insects, spiders, frogs, reptiles, snails, and invertebrates, and a wide variety of those at that. And the female will usually throw, lay eggs on a platform, and um, they'll make this nest out of twigs and branches, where they obviously uh, place their and lay their eggs, and then help their babies as they grow up. But these guys are considered sadly near threatened because. Um, the total population is not known, uh, but it's thought to be declining because of a lot of the extreme habitat destruction that's been going on in Madagascar and affecting a lot of the endemic species there. So it isn't just um, these uh, the lemurs getting affected, but we'll talk about the lemurs a lot as well. And, um, yeah, okay, we'll just worry about that. Um, the total population, and also have un over hunting in some areas, so it's likely that a lot of the um, hunting has contributed to their population decline as well. That's why they've been considered near threatened. There's some serious issues that could uh, really impede their survival in the future. But they seem to be doing well right now, at least. Near threatened is not too bad. But yeah, really wonderful birds, and I really hope to see Ron Mayron or Rihanna make some uh, more birds again, because uh, I'm always a highlight. I like seeing birds. Everyone knows I'm a bird guy. So that's awesome. So next we're going to be moving on to uh, something by Frazzle. Uh, who, does, who doesn't uh, remember Frazzle? Uh, we've got Frazzle64. He's got a very, very cool little animal here. We have got here the masked palm civet, also known as the gem face civet. It's a palm civet that's native to the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia. And it's considered the least concern, luckily. Uh, and found in many protective areas. Uh, very, very interesting little guys. And they kind of get their name, the Mask Palm Civet, is because of their face. It looks almost like they have a mask on. And I believe it's probably because they live in the forest and things like that. They're good climbers. They got a black uh, on the head and shoulders and like a grayish body. Uh, very, very interesting with blotches of white and stuff all over them and on their tail as well. Really, really cute. I think they did a really good job. And, um,. Their main body will vary from about 51 to 76 centimeters in length with a tail of 51 to 63 uh, centimeters or 20 to 30 inches and 20 to 25 inches in length and weigh between 3.6 and 6 kilograms or 7.9 and 13.2 pounds. So in terms of their ecology, they're very, very uh, widespread. They're found in northern parts of uh, the Indian subcontinent, especially in the Himalayas, uh, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, China, Borneo, Taiwan, uh, a lot of those. And they've actually been introduced to mainland Japan and some of the islands around there. And have been recorded both both in evergreen and uh, sewardous forest and in disturbed habitats. They seem to be very, very adaptable. And um, they also found that while... Um, well, genetic studies indicate that there was introduced uh, species uh, with multiple introductions over the centuries. So it wasn't just one person bringing in a population of mass uh, palm civets and um, just letting them loose. It was multiple people over time releasing palm civets. 
And it seems like at least two of these introduction events came from Taiwan, so it's very, very interesting. So, like a, a lot of other small predators and other small civets and things, they tend to be a solitary nocturnal predator. So they tend to sleep during the day. Uh, and and are occasionally active during the day, but they mainly keep to themselves. And um, when they're uh, alarmed, they often spray a secretion kind of very similar to a skunk, where they'll have it in the anal gland, and they'll kind of spray something really, really foul-smelling to kind of deter predators. So that's very interesting. And um, they are um, omnivores, so they feed on all sorts of things. They feed on rats, birds, as well as fruits such as figs, mangoes, bananas, and leaves. And scat analysis also indicates that they may be eating mollusks, arthropods, uh, bark, and even snakes and frogs to a lesser extent. So that's very, very interesting. And we know that that, popular, um, that diet can uh, vary a lot due to uh, seasons and the sites, depending on what's locally available. So um, we'll have a look at this baby. And look how cute a little baby is. So adorable. But... Um, Mass palm civets are polyacious and their mating is promiscuous. So there's about two breeding seasons each year and um, the female will bear up to four young and mass palm civets are known to live about 15 years in captivity. And copulation of these guys takes about 30 minutes and upon completing that, uh, they leave a copulation plug in the female's uh, genitals and um, the young will grow from a baby to an adult over they just once it's uh, finished gestating and is born, they'll grow at about uh, into adult size at about three months old. And um, there are some major threats affecting these guys um, and other animals in the area, such as habitat destruction. Uh, it's pretty much all the time. Um, and hunting for bush meat's another big thing, and it's actually widely offered in restaurants in Vietnam and southern China. And they're often sadly uh, victims of the illegal wildlife uh, trafficking because to meet the demands of them in China and Vietnam, and even there was like a hundred uh, civets were confiscated in April 2021. And despite relocations to save Vietnam wildlife, a wildlife um, rehabilitator, at least eight of them died from that shipment uh, due to stress and injuries. So that's very, very sad. But um, another really interesting well is that it seems like in the, the SARS uh, virus, in May 2003, it seems they were isolated in several different mass palm civets that were found in a wildlife market in um, Zhangdong, China. And the other evidence of other animals that were infected were a raccoon dog and in humans working on that market. But it also, that's, so that shows that SARS uh, is kind of a zoonotic disease and it's really like the precursor to, towards the, I don't want to say it because I know people have been shut down a lot, the... Uh, pandemic that we're currently facing so that shows how uh diseases can spread between species especially in places where the animals are under stress and that really makes you more vulnerable to diseases and it's really sad situation these wet markets and that's where that's like the mecca of where these diseases form but yeah frazzle you did a very very wonderful job with these cute, cute civets and um pretty awesome so now we're going to move on to another wonderful animal. We got one by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. We have got the collared peccary. So um, these guys are found in North and Central America and are often called the um, javelina uh, or something like that, also known as the musk hog. And they're quite big. They're actually about um, 510 to 610 millimeters or 20 to 24 inches tall at the shoulder and about a meter uh, a meter or a meter half long or about 3.3 .3 to 4 foot 11 in length they weigh between 16 and 27 kilos or 35 to 60 pounds and have small tusks that they use to uh, point towards the ground when the animals are upright along with slender legs and a robust body uh, with and along with this coarse fur and they are very very much widespread from uh uh, across the Americas. They can be found much of tropical and subtropical Americas. They can be found from the southern parts of the United States, so like Texas and um, I believe Arizona, places like that on the border, all the way down to places like um, Argentina and were actually reintroduced into Uruguay in 2017. So that's really, really awesome. And the only Caribbean item where they are native is Trinidad. Uh, but until fairly recently, they were also present on Tobago, but they're now 
um, exceedingly rare or um, potentially extinct uh, in that area because of overhunting by humans. And they're very adaptable. They can live in all sorts of different habitats, from deserts, scrublands, savannas, grasslands, uh, grasslands, uh, tropical forests, and uh, broadleaf forests. So they're very, very adaptable. And um, they're often classed as herbivores, and they normally feed on cactus, um, beans, fruits, tubers, palm nuts, and other vegetables and um, vegetation. But funnily enough, uh, they will often eat lizards, dead birds, and rodents if they get the opportunity to, uh, like most herbivores. And in areas inhabited by humans, they often will eat cultivated crops and ornamental plants, such as flowers and things. And um, in terms of their predators, they have been known, uh, their main predators include the cougar, Mexican wolves, coyotes, jaguars, and bobcats. So they're very, very important prey for these species. And in terms of behavior, they are diurnal species. Uh, so they come out during the day and feed during the day. And they live in groups of up to 50 individuals, which average between six and nine members. And they sleep in burrows, often under the roots of trees, but sometimes can be found in caves and logs, though they aren't uh, not completely diurnal in areas like Arizona. They're more active at night, but often come out in the day, to, uh, but less so in the daytime. So often that could be because of human disturbance. They try to come out in the night to avoid humans. And... Although they usually ignore humans, they will react if threatened and defend themselves with their tusks. And they also can release a pretty strong musk, that's where they get the name musk pig, uh, when they're alarmed. And they also rub their scent on rocks and tree stumps to mark territory. And they often help to identify each other. They use, uh, they rub in each other and rub their smells so that they can uh, learn about each other. So, yeah, really, really, really interesting little tidbit about the behavior of our wonderful hickories. Really, really wonderful. So we're going to be moving on from uh, Leaf and Nicholas Lineriders wonderful model. Next we're going to move on to the next one. It was just by Leaf. Uh, we have got a few uh, lemurs. Who doesn't love some lemurs? We've got the red belly lemur. So these guys are, are a type of lemur with a really really nice brown coat, and they are endemic to eastern Madagascar forests, and are distinguished by the patches of white skin between the over their eyes. And they give like almost like a teardrop effect. And um, these guys are sexually dimorphic. So the males in this species have like a. This is, I believe, this is a female. Let's see if we can find a male. Is this male? There we are. So you can see the male has like a medium long dorsal coat, uh, coat and like a very, very chestnut brown coat as well. And um, he is lighter and redder in hue with his tail, muzzle, and head being black. And for the female, the dorsal area resembles the male. Whether the ventral fur is contrasting like a white cream color, which is very, very interesting. And um, the facial markings that are similar to the males, except the teardrops are less exaggerated, and the spiky um, the chest hairs in the males are absent. And they can get quite large as well. The adult red bellied lemur can get about 35 to uh, 34 to 40 centimeters, or 13.4 to 15.7 uh, inches long, excluding the tail, with a tail length that's approximately 20% longer than the body itself. So they can retain a length of about a meter from the tail. And typical body mass of these guys typically ranges from 1.6 to 2.4 kilograms, or 3.5 to 5.3 pounds. And the males actually have a scent gland on top of their heads that they use to communicate. And their lifespans may exceed 20 years for both sexes. So that's very, very wonderful. Let's look at the wonderful one over here. Is this another male? Yeah. I want to see if we can find ourselves a little baby, and look at the babies are how adorable. So, um, as I mentioned, they're pretty much found as far north as uh, the northern reaches of Madagascar, from like the Mananara River, and they're found pretty much all through uh, this like band uh, eastern strip. There's a big strip that they live in with like intact rainforest that is obviously very very uh, at risk. Um, they also live with other lemurs, such as the common brown lemur, the red-fronted brown lemur, the grey-headed lemur, and the white-headed lemur in these areas, and they often share, like, habitats with them. And um, their range is characterized by dense evergreen growth, and um, they typically feed on the canopy of all of these really tall rainforest trees, and um, especially in the highland and the lowland ones. 
And um, these guys live in monogamous groups, so that range from 2 to 10 individuals. And they're actually one of the few lemurs that are carthermal, which means they have both um, diurnal and nocturnal uh, activity patterns, so they come up both. They have a general uh, home range of about 25 to 35 acres, or 10 to 14 hectares, and typical density of 5 animals per acre. And groups are typically cohesive as they move through the home range and feed over all sorts of species of plants. And some, considered by some to be a frugivore, they also feed on leaves and nectar and flowers from many other plant species, and are believed to be very important at dispersing seeds and pollen. And um, the typical maximum frequency is one offspring per female per year, with initial infant mortality about 50%, so basically it's a 50-50 chance if your baby survives. And births normally will occur in October and November, or early spring, uh, early summer in the southern hemisphere habitat, and um, the young uses the prehensile tails to attach to the mother for their first 33 to 37 days of life. And at this point, the mother will often uh, refuses first transport services. And while the father may continue to provide for such another nine weeks. So the dad um, is a little bit nicer on the baby lemurs than a mother is, it seems. And um, the sad thing is that modern feeding habits that have expanded the species diet to the introduced Chinese, though actually Brazilian, Guava, so they've kind of expanded their diet. And groups of uh, red belly lemurs have become habituated to people along certain trails, uh, starting in May and June. And although much later, in, uh, much more this is common in other areas. And um, they have a tame behavior and walk up to humans, and that can be quite dangerous because they can spread diseases. Also, people could probably grab them or they could bite someone. So that can be a little bit dangerous, but they seem to be uh, nothing too bad to happen now. They occur in five national parks. And several and seven uh, species reserves in eastern Madagascar, but listed and vulnerable because of a lot of different things, such as slash and burn farming, illegal logging and hunting as well. And the species is a subject of current study and its natural habitats as well as captivity in research centers such as the Dukalima Center. So very very interesting animal, uh, really really awesome, cute little babies over here. Look at that, adorable. So now we can move on from, that was Leaf. Next one, we've got another mod by Bongo Hardwood. How can you not love good old Bongo Hardwood? We have got the Black Lemur. So very, very interesting. Uh, this is the male, I believe. Yeah, and the female is the orange one. So the Black Lemur is a species of lemur that's obviously found in Madagascar. And they live in uh, northwestern Madagascar and occur in like moist forests around the Sambiro region of Madagascar and the blue-eyed black lemur is restricted to certain peninsulas and stuff and they get quite large the black lemur is between 90 and 110 centimeters in length of which I had uh, 51 to 65 is tail and they typically weigh between um, 1.8 and 2 kilograms so I think that's about 3 to 5 pounds or 4 to 5 pounds and you can see these males have this really dark or black or dark brown fur uh, that's with some really extreme sexual dimorphism, and then why you see the f females here, let's see if we can find a female. No, oh, there we are. You can see the female has like a very, very orange color along with these large tufts of fur, so that's very, very interesting. And um, it can be very orange like this, and these large white air tufts that really show the difference between the males and the females. And um, the only other species that lives in its range is the common black lemur, which overlaps with the black lemur. At uh, certain parts of his range, but it's easy to tell them apart because of their different colorations. And um, these guys, in terms of their diet, they primarily eat fruits, which make up approximately about 80% of their diet. And the ripeness of the fruit is vital to their diet. And often they all, will also eat flowers, leaves, fungi, invertebrates. And during the die season, they will also eat nectar. And um, as well, these guys typically live in primary and secondary forests. They could be active at both day and night. So they were, Look at the black uh, males while we're over here. And they forage both in the upper and middle uh, uh, canopy, especially during night and during the day. They forage in the understory. And in degraded habitats, they've also been found to even eat soil and forage on the ground. And these guys live in these large groups of about 2 to 15 individuals, with approximately equal male and females. An average group size is about 10 members. And they all share a home range of about 3.5 to 7 hectares. And these range will overlap considerably, and densities can reach 200 individuals per square kilometer. 
And they also have very interesting, they have a habit to pick up, pick up toxic millipedes. And the toxins are not fatal, fatal to the lemurs, but they actually try to stimulate the millipede to release its toxins in self-defense. And they rub the uh, millipede on their body to uh, basically create um, uh, p uh, pest repellent, so or insect repellent. So they're able to um, basically use the toxins the millipede had to keep themselves uh, safe from a lot of the biting insects. That's a very, very interesting way of evolving. And in terms of reproduction, and we'll talk about these cute little babies while we're talking about reproduction. How cute is that? But um, mating will usually take place with these guys during April and May. And during the mating season, uh, the antagonism between the males increases, and males will sometimes roam between groups. And after a gestation period of 125 days, a single infant is usually born between late August and early October, and females will typically give birth for their first time in two years of age. So yeah, very, very wonderful uh, mod from Bongo Hardwood. Uh, he did a very, very good job. I am a big fan. So yeah, now we're going to move on to our last animal. Again done by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. We've got something that we've probably all been waiting for for a while. We have got the Galada Baboon. Also known as the Bleeding Heart Monkey. Or just the Galada. As a species of uh, old world monkey that's only found in the Ethiopian highlands and live in elevations between 1,800 and 4,400 meters or 5,900 or 14,400 uh, feet above sea level. And the only living member of the group um, Seropithecus, which comes from, which means beast ape, and uh, is the closest relative other baboons and they are largely terrestrial. And they spend much of their time foraging on the grasslands, uh, so they're uh, grazers. They typically grass takes up about 90% of their diet, so they're very much grazers. And you can see from the very, very interesting look here, they've got the, these bl bluffed, uh, buff to dark brown hair with a dark face and eyelids. Adult males have these longer hairs on their black and a really a white patch on their uh, chest. And uh, females also have a uh, hair um, skin, uh, bare skin on their chest, but it's much less pronounced than the males. So it almost looks like they have a necklace, and it even brightens up during breeding um, to kind of show that they're um, uh, able to uh, mate. And um, males on average weigh 18.5 kilograms, and females 11 kilograms, or 41 to 24 pounds. And the head to body length is six, uh, 50 to 75 centimeters, or 20 to 30 inches, and um, 30 to 50 centimeter tail. Uh, or 12 to 20 inch tail. Really, really interesting. So, um, as I mentioned, they are quite big. I believe the largest uh, average about 18.5, and they think they're quite big. Um, as I mentioned, they're only found in the Ethiopian highlands, and they are considered uh, grazers. So they're really one of the few gr fully grazing monkeys, so they're big and bad for adapting to that. But they'll also eat flowers, uh, ribosomes, and roots when they get a chance. And um, they consume the food more like ungulates than primates, so that's very, very weird. And they can chew their food like zebra, so very, very efficiently. They're also particularly diurnal. So at night, they'll sleep on ledges and cliffs. And at sunrise, they'll leave with the cliffs and travel with their groups to socialize and feed. And when morning adds, it tends to wane, and usually they'll focus on, focus on foraging. And then uh, when the evening arrives, they become social again and before coming back to the cliffs. And they've been observed... Um, Predators that they deserve that's hunted these guys are like domestic dogs, lepers, um, lemurs, uh, servals, and the like. Well, let's look at the females. I we get a chance with this wonderful female. So, in terms of the social structure, they live in a very, very similar social structure in terms of the Hamadryas baboons. And the smallest, most basic groups tend to be reproductive units that are made from one, one to twelve females, the young and one to four males, and the all male unit, which is about two to fifteen males. And the next level of that are the bands, which made up by 2 to 27 reproductive units and 7 all-male units. And herds can consist of 60 reproductive units that are sometimes found in different bandits. So they have a very much fusion fission society, so they kind of just move around and mix and mingle with animals in their local area. And they're quite long-lived. They can live for about 15 years. And a lot of them, they have very strong social bonds within this and um, often uh, interact with each other, but they have been also uh, found aggression is rare, usually between females, but more um, common in males. The females are usually more um, chillaxed. And then males can remain in this reproductive group for about four years, and then they kind of go off and do their own thing and move on to their own groups. So it's very, very interesting. 
So, um, as well, the female uh, gives birth at night after she's obviously mated in, uh, with a male. And uh, newborn infants have red faces and closed eyes. And on average, when they're born, they weigh about 468 grams or 16 ounces. And if a new male accepts a harem, the female impregnated by the previous leader is at 80% likelihood of having an abortion. Uh, which is known as the Bruce effect. And then the female will come into estrus quick after that because she doesn't really want to carry the baby of the old male. She wants to carry the baby of the new male. But, um, and it's also, um, infanticide is also very uncommon compared to many other primates. So they tend to be quite good fathers, even if they are babies from other males have been born, which seems to be good. And, um, females that just give birth stay within their reproductive unit and often, uh, Adult females may take an interest in other infants and even kidnap them, so that can be very, very sad. And the infant is carried on its mother's belly for about first five weeks of life, and then on her back. And they can move independently from their mother at about five uh, months old. And then um, a subordinate male within his reproductive unit may help to care for an infant until it's six months old. And when these herds form, juveniles and babies will interact and things like that. But when males uh, reach puberty, they gather in unstable groups uh, independent from their reproductive unit and um, they uh, females will reach sexual maturity in about three years but do not give birth until after another year and males will reach puberty about four to five years but they're usually unable to reproduce because of social constraints and they need to get bigger and better to be able to compete with the other older males so they usually don't breed until they're eight to ten years old and the average lifespan is about 15 years and to add to their really really interesting social dynamics they have, we'll have a look at this baby as well as we're talking about uh, the cuteness. Um, they have a very, very uh, varied um, uh, repertoire of sounds. They'll use like, a, a level of complexity is found to be near that of humans. So they'll have all sorts of things to chat to each other. They'll have all sorts of different sounds to sign that she's an estrus of oh, this danger coming. They have very, very complex sounds with all different meanings for different things, which is really, really cool. And um, in terms of conservation, um, the Gulada baboon is often considered a crop pest by farmers uh, near the, where they live. And they can even eat like 100 kilograms of crops uh, damaged by baboon on average. And they have a preference for barley for some reason. But in 2008, they listed the um, Gulada as at least concern, although the population had reduced from an estimated 440,000 in 1970 to another 200,000 in 2008. And, uh, look at these wonderful little cuties. Well, I'll look at Dad while we're, um, carrying on with the talk. And major threats to this reproduction is, um, as a reduction of their range as a result of lots of people making farms, of course, and, sh uh, shooting this, uh, shooting them as pests, as crop, but that's always not good. And, um, they were actually often trapped to use as laboratory animals and hunted to attain their capes for clothing. But luckily, there have been new proposals for um, parks to try and protect, better protect um, populations there and hopefully help them increase. Very similar with actually like the black lemur, they're endangered as well. Um, but um, these guys are not nearly uh, as endangered, there's still 200,000. They are luckily still considered the least concerned. They're really, really awesome animals, and I'm glad and I hope there's more protections for them. Really wonderful Galada. I just love the look of them. They've got this really beautiful mane that's really, really awesome. So, on that note, Neef and Nicholas Lion Rider, you did a great job. I'm going to pull out and um, finish up the video. So, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified when I've done anything. So, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.